Hello, welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. Program number 58 in our series, The Book of Acts. We are in chapter 19, and we're going to be beginning at verse 11. It's a story titled, The Sons of Sceva. Sceva, I want to explain something real quick. Uh, the, in that period of time, the, uh, the occult-oriented practices and religions were just ubiquitous. It so happened that uh, the event about what happened to Moses, uh, we find in the third chapter of Exodus, where God appeared to Moses out of a burning bush and said, I'm going to send you to Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So Moses wanted to say, well, what, what God, are, who are you? He knew he was supernatural, some kind of God, but who? Uh, he was likely a henotheist, H-E-N-O theist. Means these people got a God, these people got a God, everybody's got a God. Well, which one, what, what's your name? And the reply Moses received was what we call the Tetragrammaton, the four letters, the Y-H-W-H, so see, the yod He wah He, the Hebrew letters. And nobody knows really how to pronounce it, only Moses heard it. And then nobody knows what it means. It sometimes said, I am that I am, I am who I am, varying all kinds of things, and who knows. But it was secret, and the high priest, now, only the high priest of Israel supposedly knew how to pronounce that tetragrammaton. And he only on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, when he went into the Holy of Holies, and he said that word one time, and the only time, and supposedly only the high priest knew it. Well, it was not uncommon for people in that day to say, well, I know the covenant name of God. Therefore, I have power. I got power. And the seven sons of Sceva, that apparently there was somebody who claimed that named Sceva that he belonged to the priestly family and had seven sons that were going about doing this. By the way, we're only going to counter two of them. It's very interesting that the, um, uh, that the best text, uh, the NIV Greek text and the... Um, uh, the American Bible Society's Greek text have the word both instead of seven. Uh, so there may have been seven, but Paul is going to encounter two of these, and they're running around making money. You have to understand that this is an occult-oriented world. Christianity came along and rejected all of that sort of thing. It's like in our world today. Our world is once again filled with the occult arts. It's been growing, 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 growing. Uh, when I did a, a Master of Theology degree, my thesis was a manual of demonology and the occult because I noticed how ubiquitous uh, the occult art was. Uh, you know, everything from talking to the dead, necromancy, fortune-telling, going to psyches, trying to find out the future, um, the actual magic itself, and then you had the extremes Satan worship, uh, expecting that uh, the devil, if you worshipped him, would grant you all these rewards and so on. The occult arts, they are flourishing today, uh, it, just like it always has. And, but it was especially so in that period. Along comes Christianity and confronts it. Very interesting. Uh, there is power in the occult. There is a reality in the occult. There is no question about it. Uh, there's lar one large Christian group, and then I'm going to go back into the text, who is claiming that Satan stole the occult arts and they really belonged to Christianity and they're reclaiming them. This is error of the greatest magnitude. But yet here we find people embracing occult arts as though it was sanctioned by the Holy Spirit of God and okay, uh, let me tell you that the occult arts, 
at least extend back 10, 15,000 years back into Siberia and the birth and uh, the birth of sh what's called shamanism, which so many uh, various world religions fully imbibe in. Shamanism is the overall and then individual kinds of religions tap into it or, or borrow their processes and theologies. So once again, we enter into a, an occult-oriented world. So now we have chapter 19, verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Uh, that is a very enigmatic statement, and I don't know what it means. By the hands of Paul, because it doesn't have anything to do with the hands of Paul. He says, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left him, them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Now, Paul worked as a tent maker. We know that much. He would have worn sweatbands across his forehead, arms, and so on. Why? I don't know. But that they were called handkerchiefs here, or aprons. They were cloth. Uh, and that Paul worked in the mornings, lectured at the Hall of Tyrannus there in Ephesus from maybe 11 to 4, sometime during that period. He, he got that use of that hall. And, uh, and so these things were maybe stolen, whatever. I don't think that Paul gave them out. Uh, we remember uh, that at one point, uh, people tried to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. And in another place, I think Mark 6, uh, people were hoping uh, that Peter's shadow would fall upon them and they would be healed. Well, that's an indication of the extent of the cult-oriented mentality. It hasn't reached that point in our culture yet, but one day it might. Who knows? So uh, Paul was not doing these things, but these sort of things were happening. Uh, I have never seen this. I have to admit, I have never seen this sort of thing taking place. Although I have read about it in the annals of missionaries and so on. I have read about it. I'm not saying it doesn't happen today. I just have never seen it. I'm not questioning this. And I would like to point out something very significant, I think. I don't want to be misunderstood here. Uh, there is a distinction between that which is has to do with evil spirits and that has to do with biologically oriented mental illness. A, a, a great difference. When I was first a Christian and I was reading about the demons in the New Testament and hearing sermons and so on, I did not believe it. In fact, I graduated with the Master of Divinity. It took me three years, a four-year program, and I left that and I didn't believe in the reality of an actual Satan or demons. I said it was just all mental conditions. My background is psychology. I did a BA and MA at Sacramento State. I was preparing to be a school psychologist. I was very psychologically oriented. And I thought, well, the Christians just, just didn't understand what they're looking at. Later, I changed my mind. I did find that there was real demonic spirits, and there really was such a thing as casting demons out, casting out. Not exorcism. Exorcism is a word that is more magical. And we begin to see the church doing exorcisms in the fourth century. Up until then, it was ek balo, uh, ek meaning out, ball meaning throw, ek balo, throw out. And then all of a sudden, the Christians were being magical. They were being occult oriented. They were practicing exorcism and not deliverance ministry or casting out of demons. They used different rites and rituals um, in order to do that. And uh, uh, they were, uh, I have questions about that. In any case, verse 13, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, well, they said they had the covenant name of God. They knew how to do it. They had this power. They undertook to invoke. Notice now Luke is carefully using 
magical terminology to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Well, they saw what Paul was doing, some of the other Christians, casting demons out in the name of Jesus. I have several books on this area. At the end of this program, I hope I remember to provide you a way to get one of my books, just recently written and published, called Delivers from Evil, How Jesus Cast Out Demons Today. I have done this by the hundreds of times. I continue to do so. Uh, it is a very real thing. You do not cast a mental illness out of somebody. These are biologically oriented, brain-centered kinds of trauma that have occurred for whatever reasons. Um, and uh, they are distinct. You don't cast out schizophrenia. Uh, my youngest brother uh, had schizophrenia. Uh, ended up, uh, when he got off his meds, committing suicide um, after he'd been back from Vietnam for about two years. I still remember the event, and uh, uh, traumatic as it was. Uh, but the distinction we must maintain between uh, real mental illness and the impact of demons and of course, they can be connected in some ways sometimes, I suppose. I'm not clear about these things. I'm no real expert. So they undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus. And they said, they would hear Christians say, the name of Jesus, come out. And uh, so they tried that over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you, I adjure, another magical term not used by Christians. Uh, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. They saw the impact, they saw the reality, the real thing now, where God has authority over the unclean spirits. A verse, 1 John 3, 8 says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Hmm, very interesting. And that, we find, is exactly true. I know that many of you are very skeptical. I'm sure that some have left the program already, uh, and I, that's okay. I thoroughly understand that, and uh, before I became a Christian, I would have done the exact same thing, or in the first four or five years after I was a Christian, I would have done the same thing too, um, and I perfectly understand that, but at any rate, uh, and it says seven, son, seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. Yes, there were seven. That much is clear. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? They didn't know. They didn't see this. It's, there was nothing there. Uh, I've actually had this happen to me. About 15, maybe 20 years ago, I actually had this very same thing happen to me. Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? Uh, it, they didn't say to me, but who are you? It, was, it happened to some other people. Anyway, I don't want to go into it. Verse 16, And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastering all of them. And this is where the NIV Greek text and American Bible Society text has both, not all. The King James Version has all. And you'd be surprised how powerful the King James Version is, is to attract the attention of the translator and they'll move to the King James, but this is clearly wrong, not all, but both of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Oh my. Um, I actually had this happen to me. I didn't flee out of the house wounded and naked, but I got beat up. Only one time. Uh, the only time that I know of that I attempted a person who was not a Christian, well, other people brought me to a person who was not a Christian and wanted me to do this, but they didn't want to do it. And don't you know, a wrestling match ensued and I got beat. And it wasn't pretty. And I would never do that again, hopefully. I, all that time and the many hundreds of times that I've done this, it only happened one time. But I understand, I recognize what happened uh, to them because uh, they had these, these two sons of Sceva had no power over the demonic spirit. And they were going to put up with this uh, kind of thing. 
And so the person in whom uh, the demonic spirits dwelt jumped on him and beat him up and beat him up bad. Uh, the word wounded here Luke uses indicates a rather long-term trauma that it took a long time to heal. So, uh, overpowered them. So, verse 17, and this became known to all the residents of, of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Well, of course, you can understand um, how that would take place. I, I, I have a note here that I almost skipped. Uh, there is a papyrus that has survived to this day uh, that show attempts at pronouncing Yahweh, the tetradrammaton, uh, the one that would be used as in, in magical incantation, incantations. One of these papyri now in the Biblica, Biblia Tech National in Paris reads this way, quote, I adjure you by Jesus, the God of the Hebrews. Interesting. So this is extant today, which sheds a little, little more credibility into this incredible passage we're looking at. Uh, the, I, again, I adjure you. <clears throat> Notice adjure. A magical statement, not a biblical statement, by Jesus here, referring to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the God of the Hebrews. They have almost got it right, the God of the Hebrews. So you see how influential uh, the uh, the uh, fake exorcist uh, thought about the name of Jesus. Um, they recognized something, but they didn't get it right. Okay, the next sentence at the end, of uh, the middle of 17 says, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Um, that's, that's quite an incredible, uh, incredible statement um, that uh, we find here uh, that <coughs> fear fell. Um, it, it, and it is the word phobos, fear. Well, what happened, what was happening here was that the whole religious premise that they'd built their world around was in the process of collapsing. Um, Ephesus was one of the more strange cities of its time. Around 200,000 people lived there. It was home of the Temple of Artemis, or Diana in, in Latin. And uh, people came from all over the world. It was a major attraction. We're gonna read, we're gonna learn more about this in the next program. Uh, it was one of the uh, seven wonders, seven wonders of the uh, ancient world. I'm going to describe um, the, uh, the Temple of Artemis uh, next week, uh, but it was quite a place, and when you hear it, you'll understand why it was a, um, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, but so here we have the Ephesians, and uh, their whole the whole foundation of uh, what, what they believed was, was crumbling, was being challenged. And that's what, one of the reasons why Christianity is often uh, uh, offensive to people. Because if Christianity is true and right, well, uh, what's going on here? Uh, and so, if that's right, what I believe is wrong. And of course, we, it's going to be challenged. And it's very difficult to attack the theology. What happens is the person who presents the Christian message is attacked. It's called attacking uh, the messenger rather than the message, because the message is not easy to attack. Uh, and so we often find this. Christians are used to it. Um, we know that it will happen. If we just mention sometimes the wrong word, we get a furrowed brow. We uh, have the phone hung up. Uh, end of conversation. End of relationship. It goes on and on. So, uh, so fear fell upon them all. 
But the name of Jesus was extolled because here was freedom. The bondage to demonic spirits is a huge one. The great Martin Luther hymn, and though this world will, uh, with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. Martin Luther knew about the reality of the demonic and, uh, and know that the world is full. We don't know why this is, why God allows this. It makes no sense to us. It's just a reality that cannot be ignored. So the fear fell on them. Also, verse 18, also many of those who were new, now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. I've had this happen to me a lot. Sometimes overwhelming. Uh, and bringing the stuff that they had acquired, all kinds of stuff large variety of stuff back in the Jesus people days in particular and saying, I don't want this anymore. Get rid of it for me. Get rid of it for me. And I would. Uh, and so that's what happened. Uh, and they, they had been believing, but now, now they weren't believing anymore in that stuff. They weren't going to go back to the magical um, and the, uh, the fortune telling and communicating with the dead and talking with angels and animal spirits and on and on, which is what they did. And uh, they, they had a, it, was, it, it starts out being interesting, exciting. Wow. You, you, be, you move from a 100% uh, materialist to 100% supernaturalist. Bam, there it is. You know that there is a supernatural now for sure. It's just over a period of time it becomes controlling and tormenting and very difficult to cope with. So uh, these are the sorts of things that happen. Okay, I have to hurry on. So they came confessing, notice, confessing and divulging. In other words, they gave up, divulging. They got rid of uh, the books of, of, of the magical incantations. They were big sellers in that day. Uh, I have actually seen some uh, books of these kinds of an, uh, incantations. When I was doing my thesis, THM thesis, I found a bunch of these in b weird bookstores in the Bay Area. And there were books of incantations, magical rites, and many of them incorporated Christian symbols and names. The name of God, the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, all kinds of stuff invoking the name of Peter and Paul and the Bible and so on, but they were used as magical incantations, rit ritualistic kinds of things that were said where you were doing different things. And was, the idea was it was to control certain powers, uh, certain spirits. It would to um, earn or force supernatural powers to act in your favor or to get done what you wanted to get done. Uh, and I had those by the dozen, and they were strange. And if you didn't know better, you think maybe I'm looking at a Christian a publication here. But on further analysis, no, comes very close. Comes very close, by the way. And a number of those who brought the mag practice magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. Burned them in the sight of all. Um, and they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. 50,000 pieces of silver. Um, I've read a couple of descriptions of what that was amounting to. One figure was $6 million in today's money. Uh, the, the silver coin, the coins were silver coins that would be the, the drachma, worth approximately a day's wage. Um, that's hard to be, be sure of, uh, but uh, in any case, um, uh, it was worth a lot of money. Uh, I remember back in the Jesus People day, days when we began to find out uh, about the, the occult practices and how it had just inserted and ingrained itself into the whole hippie movement that with, it, it tied in perfectly with the Eastern religious, the religions, you know, um, uh, transcendental meditation, the Hare Krishna people, 
and, and various other groups, it, it, it wove itself into it. Um, we had a revival of uh, some of the uh, Eastern means of fortune telling, the I Ching. People became fascinated with the Ouija board. Uh, they were going to mediums and psychics. People were becoming mediums and psychics. They thought it was wonderful. I mean, they were in contact uh, with spirits who were telling people about their past. Uh, and the, the, most, the, the biggest ones that drew their great attention were those who supposedly could tell you about your past lives, all made up, you know, fake stuff. Uh, but um, that's, that's just the way uh, that, that it worked. And <clears throat> all of a sudden, people were finding real relief that Jesus actually, the followers of Jesus actually, cast out demons. It was so large. I have a, I have a sense that we are returning to those kinds of days. I want to read a, um, a, a, something that uh, Shakespeare wrote uh, in um, his play, The Comedy of Errors. Uh, this is in Act One and Scene Two. Here's what Shakespeare wrote. They say this town is full of cosenage. Cosenage, that means a cheat or deceiver. So they say this town is full of cosenage. As nimble jugglers that deceive the eye. Dark working sorcerers that change the mind. Soul killing witches that deform the body. Disguised cheaters prat pratting, pratting montebacks. A montebac is a huckster who sells quack medicines and many such like liberties of sin. That's, that's from Shakespeare, not exactly known as an evangelical Christian. Um, verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. They are undergoing an awakening. We are not experiencing awakening in our day. If one were to come, uh, we would find out uh, that the word of God would prevail mightily and we would see people turning away from the occult practices that uh, so con control so many lives in so many interesting little and large ways. Well, if you follow this, this, uh, this particular program all the way through, you've unlikely heard some things uh, that you've never heard before. And I'm going to be putting up here at the end, I'm going to be putting up a way you can contact and get a hold of the little book called Deliverers from Evil, How Jesus Cast Out Demons Today, a short book, and I think it will be very helpful. So long.